I got a message on my, I got a, a, a tweet on my Twitter feed. And it was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. It, it came from the National Psychiatrist League, the NPL. And it, it said that after three years of research, they had come up with a really interesting finding. They said that one in every five Americans is weird. <laughs> yeah, can you believe that? I mean, it's, it's like crazy town, really? The NPL, it sounds like a, a nerd football team. I've never heard of the NPL. But look, even though I don't know the group, I don't have any problem with their research. Think about it. Let's, we can test it out. I, what I want everybody to do is look, to someone, look at someone to your left. Look at someone to your right. If there's somebody in front of you, look at somebody in front of you. If there's somebody behind you, look at somebody behind you. OK, now. How many people think they're normal? <laughs> One person. <laughs> know what that, mean? that, that means? How many people think the, the other people are normal? Look normal. That means you're the weirdo. We're on a journey through life with weirdos. Weird stuff happens all the time. I got kicked out of Victoria's Secret the other day. <laughs> Can you believe it? Apparently, they frown on guys going in there with sandwiches, lawn chairs, and beer and making an afternoon out of it. <laughs> I was not aware of this change. There's nothing more embarrassing than getting your butt kicked by three women in sexy underwear, I'm telling you right now. I'm going back next week with a keg and a kiddie pool full of lime jello. That <laughs> is going to be one heck of a restraining order. So I go across the street. There's a little shop across the street that has, you can go in there and get your handwriting analyzed. You know, they do it by computer. You sign your name to a sheet of paper, they pop it into a computer, kicks out all sorts of interesting information about you. It's a little pricey, it's like 300 bucks, but I did it. Turns out I'm gullible, easily fooled, and susceptible to con men and scam artists. So money well spent. <laughs> I was kind of hungry. I, I went down the street to get something to eat. And at some of the Wendy's hamburger restaurants, they have these comment cards on the table. So on the card, it says, as you can see, at Wendy's Old Fashioned Hamburgers, you are the chairman of the board. I haven't gotten a paycheck. <laughs> I haven't been invited to any of the meetings. I go next door to the Target store. They've got a similar thing at their checkout. It's got a picture of a Target store employee on the front. And on it, it says, I'm reading your mail. Yeah. These pinheads at Target are taking my Wendy's checks. <laughs> I am not happy about that. There's weird stuff all the time. I saw this in the paper the other day. The Food and Drug Administration has issued their yearly list of acceptable amounts of Rodent hair and insect body parts allowable in food. Yeah, can you believe? Acceptable amounts, really, FDA? How about no flies in my cherry pies? Spider legs in my enchilada? How about nada? It's not like you find a red hair in your Big Mac and you go, all right, I find three more of these. I'm taking this thing back. It's just crazy. The world is crazy. It truly is. Every now and then you hear a neat story that's got a little weird thing in it. This is, I saw this in the paper the other day. There's a, a company in the United States that has started a program in conjunction with Walt Disney World where they send underprivileged children down to the Orlando theme park free of charge. This is a cool program with one critical flaw. They're taking these poor kids out of their rat infested homes and sending them to a land where the mice are 10 feet tall. <laughs> Crazy. I'm just saying the world is weird, and maybe laughter is part of the cure. I'm Tom, and I'm a comedian. Thank you. Got my, uh, got my 28 year chip today, pretty excited about that. But I wasn't always a comedian, I didn't start out that way. When I was very young, my parents thought that I was going to be very successful in the product manufacturing business. My dad said when I was a baby, I was a pooping machine. <laughs> and I'm sure all of you know a little bit about that from your history with twins. I had the three things you needed to be successful in that business at that particular time. I had no 
startup costs, I had no inventory costs, and I had no bowel control. My parents took care of all that. All I had to do was take in raw material and push out product. And this, this was a great gig until about two years in when my parents decided they wanted to change the method of distribution. The next thing you know, we are flushing product right down the toilet. Of course, let's be honest, the product was, well, you know. But I had a very normal childhood. I was the fifth of five kids which apparently freaked my mom out the entire time she was pregnant with me. She had read in some magazine somewhere that every fifth child born was Chinese. So, <laughs> not terribly smart, my mom. But I, I, was, I, think, I, thought, I think that they thought I was a pretty sharp kid. And I think I probably was too. Now look, I was no Wolfgang Amadeus show off, you know, composing a symphony at age eight. I, I mean, I could have done it. I really could have. How hard can it be, right? But I didn't have the right equipment. I mean, this was my keyboard. It's like half an octave. It is impossible to write complex music on something like that. I needed a real instrument. I needed one of these things. But even then, I probably wouldn't have been very good because I, I didn't have a very good drummer. Okay? I, I wanted this guy, or this guy, or even this guy. This, this was my drummer. Okay. <laughs> He sucked, he was horrible. But he didn't cost very much. So the trade-off in what little I had to pay in compensation was paid back uh, in, in what I got, for the got from the guy. But I had a pretty normal childhood for the most part. I had no juvenile incarceration, no trips back home in the back of a police car. So pretty normal. Now my parents did think I was pretty smart. And at one point they wanted me to have my brain mapped. This was a big thing back when I was a kid. You know, these places would pop up. We could do all these weird things. And it, 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 they would, supposed experts would, would do some of these things for you. So my parents took me to have my brain mapped. And this was a fairly simple complex for what I thought was a fairly complex scientific procedure. I remember it required some sort of a head enclosure and some vacuum tubes and a, a $1,000 check made out to cash. Okay, and here's what the map showed at that very young age. This was my brain. <laughs> Not a lot of heavy lifting going on up there when I was a kid. But I did all the normal things you're supposed to do when you're a kid. You know, I, I, I hit all the benchmarks. I learned to ride a bike when I was five. When I was eight years old, I stole a candy bar from a local drugstore. And 30 minutes later, riddled with guilt, I returned a gently used candy bar to the same drugstore. I learned to ride my, I, I got my first bike when I was 11. How many people remember the Stingray? Oh, was this a cool ride or what? This was a sweet bike. I love the banana seat, the high rise handlebars, that five speed gear shifter on the center bar. Oh man, this thing, this was like the Batmobile of bicycles. It really was, it was nimble, it was quick, it was maneuverable. And even at that young age, this thing was a chick magnet. Yeah, <laughs> this was not my bike. No. This was my bike. <laughs> a pink girl Schwinn handed down from my sister, complete with a pink basket, pink streamers off the handlebars, and a pink bell. You know, I said the, the, the Stingray was like the Batmobile of bicycles. That girl's bike was like the wiener mobile on bicycles. Because I felt like a wiener driving that thing. But it did make me tough, I'll tell you. I got beaten up every time I rode that bike through the neighborhood. So my childhood was pretty normal. I went on, I graduated from high school, went on to college. And even though I was ready to go to college in my, as a kid, you know, I'm 18, I want to get away from home, I want to go to college. I wasn't ready brain-wise, I don't think. Remember my brain when I was a kid? Had they done another mapping of that when I was 18, it wouldn't have changed very much. Here, here I was at 18. And you can see that the studying still occupied a very small part of my brain. In spite of that, I had a pretty good experience in college. I started out, I loved it. I loved being away from home. I went to class and I finished my freshman year at the University of Cincinnati, achieving a scholastic level that I never expected to achieve. And I was pretty proud of myself. 
Then that summer, between my first and second year, something happened. I went home for summer break, something happened. And I honestly, I don't know what it was. I cannot tell you. But somehow my focus got pulled. And I wasn't as good a student going back my sophomore year. I went from one end of the scholastic scale to the other. And I was asked to leave the University of Cincinnati after my second year. Pretty proud of that. Now, I'm sure there were things that I could have done that second year. And again, I, I couldn't tell you to this day. It's been so long ago. I couldn't tell you to this day what those were. <laughs> Let me think. You know, I can't, I can't come up with anything. But I'm sure I could have done something differently. I transferred up to Bowling Green. Do we have any Falcons in the room? Falcons? OK, one, two, couple, three. Good, couple Falcons. I loved Bowling Green. It was great. Really enjoyed my time there. And when I graduated from Bowling Green, my first job out of college was with a company right here in Toledo. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. This was the company to work for in Toledo back in the mid 80s. Dana Corporation manufactures auto parts and supplies for the trucking, for the auto and trucking industry. And back in the, in the 70s and the 80s, it was the place to work. And what they, one of the things that, that Dana had that I really loved was this very cool motto. I love this. And I used to think, man, to work for a company that feels this way about their employees, that's incredible. I figured I would spend the rest of my professional life at Dana Corporation. I'd be wearing nice suits to work, wingtip shoes. I'd be flying on the corporate jet. I couldn't wait to get my hands on a key to the men's room, especially considering my previous experience in that very same field. And I really thought that at the end of my life, my professional life, I would be the recipient of a gold watch from Dana Corporation for 30 years of valued service. That's what I thought. Dana had other plans. <laughs> Remember the motto I told you I love so much? Well, for about two weeks, Dana changed their motto just slightly to more accurately reflect their opinion of me. And I was out of a job after two years. So that's fine. You know, I recovered. I did a bunch of bouncing from one job to another. And it was about this time, oh, I got a job for a team of physicians right here in Toledo. And this was a great gig. I was working for these doctors. They were surgeons. I loved it. It was a clean place to work, you know, very, very antiseptic, very sterile. It was very nice. I was working with smart people. And I really enjoyed the intellectual challenge of working for these doctors. I liked the fact that I could be professional in that situation. I learned a lot about the patient-provider relationship while I worked for the doctors, which would come into play in my life later on. About the same time, I was seduced by the siren song of stand-up comedy. Yeah, I thought I was a pretty funny guy. And a club had opened right here in Toledo. It was the first real live standalone comedy club, and they had an open mic on Tuesday night. So I wrote 10 minutes of material, and I invited 20 of my closest friends out to the club for my first time on stage, and I got up and proceeded to deliver 10 minutes of the most excruciatingly bad stand-up comedy in the city of Toledo. Well, in the contiguous night, okay, well, I was bad. I sucked. I was so bad. But the weird thing about stand-up comedy is you, there's a rush when you do it. And even though I was awful, let me tell you, I have an audio tape of the first time I did stand-up comedy. I cannot listen to it in the privacy of my own house alone because I was that bad. But there was a rush. There was an excitement to doing that. It was like I had mainlined poorly written material, weak premises, bad transitions, and forced supportive laughter directly into my bloodstream. And I was hooked. It was great. I kept working out. I was working for the doctors. I kept working on my stand-up career. And eventually, I traveled all over the eastern part of the United States and a little bit out west doing stand-up as a living, as a professional comedian. About this time, I was taking some acting classes up in Detroit. There was an acting coach who would come from LA to Detroit once a month, and he would do a three-day workshop. So you'd lecture, he'd lecture on the first day, and then we'd have two days of workshop. It was about $200 each time he came, and I invested about $1,200 into my acting career. 
And at one point, he had come to me after a class, he said, have you ever considered going out to LA and pursuing an acting career? Well, you don't have to tell me twice. The next thing I know, I start saving up my money and I'm gonna to move to LA. I did this, I did this in late 1993. One of the first things I did when I got to Los Angeles was I signed up with a company called Central Casting. Central Casting is a company that provides background players or atmosphere players, extras, in TV shows and movies. Okay, so if you're watching your favorite TV show and, and all the people are sitting in a restaurant, you see all the people sitting at the other tables, there are people sitting at the bar, those are all extras. Those are cast by companies like Central Casting. So I signed up. One day, I'm sitting in my apartment with my girlfriend at the time and we're watching television and this show comes on. And I remember turning to Val and saying, oh, this show is awful. This is, the, I would not want anything to do with this show. I wouldn't want to write for it. I wouldn't want to act in it. I swear to you, three days later, I get a phone call from Central Casting. We're looking for somebody to play a referee on an episode of Saved by the Bell. <laughs> never say never. Alex, there's no kissing and wrestling. <laughs> That blue arrow was not in the original broadcast. I put that in later. It was my first and my last acting gig in Los Angeles over a period of four years. But it was fun. <laughs> and my nephew's, my nephew's 33 now. He still calls me up. I just saw you on Saved by the Bell. Because <laughs> it runs like 18 times a week. So it was exciting. It was kind of a cool thing to be involved with that. And I was still doing stand-up. But I was starting to have what I refer to as a crisis of purpose. I thought, what am I doing? I, I felt like something was missing in my life. There were people I knew who were out risking their lives every day as part of their job. There were guys running into burning buildings to save people and pets and, and homes and belongings. There were people who were in the armed services of our country protecting our safety. I'm telling jokes to drunks in bars. What the heck was I doing? So I called my sister and I said, look, I'm having this, I'm having this issue. And she said, she said, well, what's the problem? I said, well, I'm not cut out for that risky kind of work. If I were in the service, the first time something like this happened and I found myself in a situation where someone was shooting at me, there wouldn't be enough of these in the world <laughs> to clean up the mess that I would make. But she said, don't worry about the fact that you're a comedian. Don't negate the importance of humor. She said, when people come into a comedy club and hear you talk for 30 minutes or 45 minutes, they watch an hour and a half show, she said, you're taking them away from their lives for a little while. And you don't know what people are dealing with. They could be having relationship problems. They could be having problems with their kids. Maybe their work is, is rough on them. She said, so they get a chance to escape for a little while while they're in a comedy club. I thought, oh, this is kind of cool. So I actually am doing some sort of a service. You saw pictures of my brain when I was young and in college, I was not cut out for this type of work. I mean, I could never be one of these guys. I could work in the medical profession, but I wasn't smart enough to do whatever, 10 or 15 years of medical school. I was a comedian. So the idea of the importance of humor was really brought home to me about 10 years ago when my dad got sick. So let me introduce you to my dad. That's my dad, Bill Huffbauer. He was one of these guys that Tom Brokaw wrote about. He served in the Navy, helping save the world from Adolf Hitler. He also had a great sense of humor, and we suspect that he may have had a hideous face when he was a younger man, <laughs> although the jury is still out on that. But my dad was my hero. He had worked in construction all of his life. He had worked really hard, and he always thought that I should have followed him into the, the building trade. And I just said, Dad, I, I, I can't do that kind of stuff. And I would go while I was doing stand-up. Eventually, I quit working for the doctors. I was doing stand-up as my only source of income. And it could be a tough life. And I would go home and complain to my parents about how I, you know, a gig canceled and I wasn't making any money. And my dad would say things like, why don't you go on down to the refinery over there? I know it's dirty work. It's shift work. It's awful work. Dad, don't oversell it, OK? <laughs> he wanted me to have a stable job. And I said, Dad, I couldn't do that kind of work. 
Well, my dad had done it his entire life. And my dad had also smoked most of his life. And as he got older, he had a list of ailments. I'm, I'll show you a few of them right now. That he started to suffer from as he got older. Oh, those hammer toes. Have you ever seen those things? Oh, those are not for the faint of heart. But he had all these problems. And as he got older, uh, we, I would take him to his doctor's appointments. And he had smoked, like I said, he had smoked 40 years of his life. Hadn't smoked since I was about 10, but that takes a toll. And the mesothelioma. And at one point, he had gone to his lung doctor, and his lung doctor said, well, you need to be on oxygen 24-7. Well, he fought it like crazy. He hated having that thing in his nose. He hated carrying that bottle around. But eventually, he got used to having to live like that. Short time after this appointment, he had gone out with, with my mother and some friends out to dinner. It was in the winter. And walking out of the restaurant, he slipped on the ice, fell, and broke his hip. So I went to see him in the hospital that night. And when I walked into the room, I noticed that he's lying in the bed, and there's oxygen on the back wall to feed whoever's lying in that bed, but he didn't have the oxygen connected to his nose. So when his nurse came in and kind of grunted at me, I said, and I said it as nicely as I could say it, because I didn't want to be unpleasant to the people who were taking care of my dad, because I didn't know how they would, if they would get mad at me and take it out of my dad when I wasn't in the room. So I said, I just want you to know my dad is supposed to be on oxygen 24-7. And she said, well, it's not in his chart. I said, okay. Well, I said, I understand it's not in his chart. And I know what that's like. I work, I've worked in the medical profession. But he does, I'm his son, and he does need to be on oxygen 24-7. She said, well, sir, it is not in his chart. Well, you only say that to me twice. We had words in the room, we went out in the hallway, we had words out in the hall, and I was not very happy at this point. Now, put yourself in the perspective of the nurses. Who would have done something differently when I made that comment to her? Who might have handled it differently? Just put your hands up. Yeah, what, what, might, be, what, what might you have said in that situation? I would have gone to ask the head nurse to find a that wouldn't, that's a great suggestion to hear that she would have gone and find the head nurse or talk, talk to a doctor. I was at that point in no, in no state of mind to talk to anybody else because I would have lashed out at them. Was there another way that, that she could have handled this? Although that's a very, a very valid thing, but in my mental state, that would have been, they would have hauled me out in leg irons. Anybody else? Write it on the chart. Write it on the chart myself? That would have been good. Or she could, yes. It wasn't even turned on. None of it was turned on. Yeah. So it wasn't like he had pulled it out. They hadn't even hooked it up. I, I, here's what I would have done. This is my thinking. I would, had I been the nurse, I would have said, oh, geez, you know what? These doctors, if they, their heads weren't, weren't screwed on, they'd lose them. Let me go find out what's going on, and I'll get this taken care of. She could have handled it with a little bit of humor, a little bit of a lighter touch, instead of snapping at me twice. Now, the problem with that is that sort of reaction could be very far-reaching. Because not only was I angry at her, I wasn't in any position to talk to anybody else because I was angry at the doctors, I was angry at the other healthcare workers on his floor taking care of him. I was angry at the hospital, Our Lady of Perpetual Screw-Ups. <laughs> I was not in a very good mood. And the thing is, my father had checked in with a raging UTI. And if you know anything about elderly people in UTIs, they are crazy. As far as I know, he was reliving his war days in Hawaii. Or perhaps he was admiring the beautiful cruise ship that was parked right outside of his hospital window, even though we were miles from the nearest river, lake, stream, or other large body of water. <laughs> I still think that somewhere in that tangled mess that was going on in his head, he probably heard what had happened. He knew that I was upset, and that made him upset. And by the way, I get it. Do we have any nurses in here? Any? Okay. I get it. It's a tough, tough business. You're overworked. You're undermanned. The money probably isn't very great. I get it. And I know that in other professions, this happens in other professions, it seems like everybody is overworked. Whatever business you're working in, there's not enough money to do the job. There are not enough people to do the job. And the stress levels are out of this world. I get it. But in this particular case, I don't care that you're stressed. That's my dad. 
He's the guy who raised me. He changed my diaper when I was a baby. He took me on my first canoe trip. He came to every wrestling match I ever wrestled in in the five years I wrestled in junior high and high school. He came to see my movie in 2001 when I produced my first film. He went to see me do stand-up, even though I was doing rather questionable material back in those days, and he still laughed. He was my supporter. And if I get angry because you're not doing a good job of taking care of him, that's because he can't defend himself and someone has to do that for him. Like I said, the nurses weren't the only ones we had trouble with. And I have a lot of respect for nurses, but there were technicians. I saw an x-ray tech practically beat my dad up trying to get x-rays from him because he was out of, his, out of his head. And I was outside. She didn't know that I was outside the door. It was incredible how she was speaking to him and how she was moving him. When I finally moved into the room, her demeanor changed completely because I was in the room. But I couldn't believe it. What else is going on when I'm not there? Doctors. The, the, the staff at the nursing home he lived in, hospice people. Here's the problem when you experience something like that, when you experience any sort of a weird customer service thing. When I get really good customer service, I tell a couple people. When I get bad customer service, I tell everybody because I got a big mouth. And I tell them I'm going to tell everybody. So. Maybe you can't handle everything with humor, but maybe just a little bit of a change of attitude, maybe a little lighter touch. Laughter is a great thing, though. If you can figure out how to use laughter in your life, it's really an incredible bit of medicine. Laughter is an involuntary reaction to mirth with an audible vocal expulsion of air. Why is it so important, though? It increases job performance. It helps connect one person to another. It cuts down the distance between people. It sends more oxygen to the heart and the brain. There was a guy uh, at the American College of Cardiology at the University of Maryland, Dr. Michael Miller. He had done a series of studies on laughter. And he determined that laughter offsets the impact of mental stress. So it's important to laugh just for your own mental well-being. Laughter is believed to release endorphins. Not the endorphins, not Ralph and, and Cynthia Endorphin who live down the street and go to the hospital once a year for their couple's colonoscopy. Not them. <laughs> endorphins. This is the only slide I could get of an endorphin. Right? Endorphins improve that overall sense of well-being. They temporarily relieve pain. And they can help you to relax. They help strengthen your immune system. They fight off annoying bugs. They can help or ease chronic pain. Endorphins can improve creativity. And they can even help with problem solving. And believe me, we got a lot of problems in this world. The other thing is it's impossible to be mad at someone if you're both laughing. Try it sometime. Try to be angry with someone when you're laughing. You can't do it. They don't collide in your brain properly. There are financial implications associated with laughter. There's a great book, maybe some of you have read it. It's by one of my favorite authors, Malcolm Gladwell. It's called Blink. But I want to read something for you. Just a little passage. He can explain it better than I can. There are financial implications to laughter. Laughter, if you're in a position where you might be sued by somebody, a doctor, a nurse, an attorney, laughter can keep people from suing you. And I'll, I'll, I'll read this little passage here for you. Analysis of malpractice lawsuits show that there are highly skilled doctors who get sued a lot, and doctors who make lots of mistakes and never get sued. At the same time, the over number, overwhelming number of people who suffer an injury due to the negligence of a doctor never file a malpractice lawsuit at all. In other words, patients don't file lawsuits because they've been harmed by shoddy medical care. Patients file lawsuits because they've been harmed by shoddy medical care and something else happens to them. What is that something else? It's how they were treated on a personal level by their doctor. 
What comes up again and again in malpractice cases is that patients say they were rushed or ignored or treated poorly. People just don't like to sue doctors. They like is how Alice Birkin, a leading medical, practice, me medical malpractice lawyer, puts it. In all the years I've been in this business, I've never had a potential client walk in and say, I really like this doctor and I feel really terrible about it, but I want to sue him. We've had people come in saying they want to sue some specialist and we'll say, we don't think the doctor was neg negligent. We think it's your primary care doctor who is at fault. And the client will say, I don't care what she did. I love her and I'm not suing her. Laughter is pretty powerful. So how do you bring humor into your life? How do you start to apply humor on a daily basis, either at work or in your home life? Well, first of all, you don't have to be a comedian to, to do that. Now, for those younger people, this is Bob Hope. <laughs> he was a comedian back in a long time ago. He used to do the Vietnam shows, the USO shows, very funny guy. Uh, you don't have to be him. You don't have to be Jerry Seinfeld. You do not have to be Ellen to bring humor into your life. You don't have to be Kevin Hart, although it probably helps if you are. <laughs> Everybody has the ability to be humorous. Attila the Hun was probably a funny guy. In fact, I have it on very good authority that he was known to his closest friends as Attila the Fun. <laughs> yeah. This guy was a funny guy. Leading our nation through a bloody civil war that separated brother from brother. And he still had a great sense of humor, which helped him be a better leader. This guy, whether you like him or not, he was a funny guy. Do you remember when he was overseas and that guy threw a shoe at him and he kind of dodged on the podium? It was funny. Our current president is a very funny guy. So how do you do that? How do you bring humor into your life? Well, let's talk about a few ways. You may need to learn how to be humorous. Not how to tell a joke, but just how to release that inner humor part of you. I'm going to explain this with a little story. When I was living in LA, I'd moved out there with my girlfriend. We, had been to, we were together for three years. A year here in Ohio, and then two years in LA, and then we broke up. I'd been out of the dating market for three years. And I thought that I, had law, I didn't know how to do it anymore. I didn't know how to flirt. Well, in LA, and they have a company out there that provides these classes for people. It's called the Learning Annex. And you can go to the Learning Annex and learn how to be a reader for the studios or learn how to be a personal assistant to a celebrity. They also had a class, Learn How to Flirt. I thought, okay, I could probably benefit from this. It was like 25 bucks. I mean, how bad can it be, right? So the, the class was being taught by the woman who wrote this book. I had a copy of this book, and I was going to have her sign my book, which I did. And so I signed up for the class. I drove out to the beautiful Lowe's Santa Monica Hotel right there on the ocean. I walked in and I found the room. It was a room about this size. And I walked, and as I walked in the room, there were about 25 people in the room. And I remember looking around at everybody and thinking to myself, what a bunch of losers. <laughs> and then I thought, oh my God, I'm a loser too. But she had some really interesting things to say about flirting, which also apply with humor. She said you have to practice flirting all the time. You flirt with everybody. You do the same with humor. If you're going to try to bring humor in your life, try it with everybody. Try it with the girl who's checking you out at the grocery store. Try it with the guy who delivers the pizza to you. <laughs> now, you don't have to try it with this guy. I don't recommend that. But you want to practice all the time, and so it becomes second nature. The same as flirting. You don't want to flirt with somebody if you haven't practiced it and get, get all tongue-tied and stumbly in the middle of your, of your flirt, right? <laughs> same thing with telling a joke, bringing humor in. When the time comes, you'll be ready to go. Sometimes even then, nerves can get the best of you. And so I'm going to show you six panels of a Gary Larson cartoon. It's, it's the funniest thing I've seen regarding this practicing to do something very important. So here we go. This one's a little hard to read. I'll read it for you. It says, it's Tarzan swinging on a vine. It says, how do you do? My name is Tarzan, and I believe you are known as Jay.
<laughs> I lost that cartoon. I feel for the guy. I've been in that situation. I talked about how humor can help you make a connection, it can shorten that distance between people. When I worked for the physicians, every now and then I would have to go into an exam room where the doctor was meeting with a patient. I remember going in there, and the, the doctor I worked, one of the doctors I worked for was dealing with this elderly patient, and as he finished his exam, I noticed that his hand was on the knob of the door in the office. And he asked her, he said, do you have any questions for me? And she said, oh, no, doctor, I'm, I'm, I'm good. So I took her out of the office down to my room where I was going to take some pictures of her. And when we got in the room, the first thing she said to me, she asked me a question about her disease process. And I said, I'm sorry, you have to speak to the doctor about that. I can't help you with that. I'm just a photographer. She said, oh, but the doctor seems so busy. Yeah. So even something like that, something as simple as being mindful of how you present to someone makes a difference. One of the quickest ways to bring, start to bring humor into your life is, is just sharing a smile. A smile is an amazing thing. It doesn't cost you anything. It's right there. You're already equipped with it. And it shortens, again, that distance between people. It's amazing what a smile can do. Spend more time with happy people. You can't, not these people, these are my happy people. You can't spend time with them. You get your own happy people. Catch anybody messing with my happy people, there's going to be trouble. But spend time with happy people. Use funny stories or cartoons whenever they're appropriate. Here are a couple of my favorite ones. Isn't that great? I love the bunny just waiting to get into that operating room. It's God making the snake. If you can't see it, he's at a table. There's a box of clay there, and he's thinking to himself, boy, these are a cinch. Now, this one was on the Ellen Show, so I feel safe showing you this. Anybody not get it? I love it. There are appropriate times to use humor, and there are times that are not appropriate. And it's going to be different for everybody. When my dad passed away about eight years ago, my three brothers, my sister, my mom, we all went to the funeral home to set up my dad's funeral. And the funeral director said, now, by the way, I want you to know your dad is entitled to have a military service because he served in the Navy. We said, well, what does that involve? He said, well, we can have, he can have taps played right there at the grave site. We'll put a flag over his casket. He can have a 21-gun salute. And we also do this really nice thing where we release some doves right at the end. Being his kids, we all said, you know, if those guys with the 21-gun salute are locked and loaded in pretty good aims, when they release those doves, we got a hot meal at the reception. <laughs> and I've told this story, which actually happened. And I've had people come up to me afterwards and say, that's so offensive. It wouldn't have been to my dad. You've got to remember, this was my dad. <laughs> he would have loved it. So for us, it was a tribute to my dad to be able to joke about this. We spent an hour and a half with the funeral director at the funeral home. And we got, when we got done, he said, I have never laughed so much setting one of these things up as I did with your family. Seek out entertainment that has humor in it. Go see a funny play. Go see a great improvisational comedy troupe. Watch funny movies. Watch funny TV shows. My entire family, we're all big fans of Seinfeld. When we get together, we're always dropping lines from Seinfeld. Why not use the best writers in the world to pepper your conversations. The people from Seinfeld aren't going to come after you and sue you. And if they do, all you got to do is make them like you and they won't sue you. <laughs> Have a laugh at your own expense. This is me in a very popular mullet. <laughs> this is me with a very popular undiagnosed medical condition. Woke up with it, just like that. I couldn't believe it. 
If you're going to do this, if you want to bring humor into your life, don't be afraid to dip your toe in the water. The worst that can happen is somebody will be offended or, or they won't laugh and you just kind of go, okay, well, I'm going to move on. You have to make a, a, an attempt. You have to try. And don't also be put off by people's appearance. Some people have a resting bee face. Some of the younger people know what I'm talking about. Resting angry face. Don't be put off by that because sometimes they can be the people with the biggest sense of humor at all, of all. My brother used to work at Toledo Hospital in the cath lab as he was putting himself through law school. And he would, his job was to transport patients from the waiting room back to the area where they did the procedure and then back out. And so oftentimes when he'd go get somebody in a wheelchair, he would, as they were heading back, he would say, can I get you a warm blanket? And they would always say, oh, a warm blanket would be so nice. My brother would say, okay, that'll be $10. <laughs> it wasn't $10. But he was breaking the ice with these people. And he was making that little experience maybe a little more tolerable. About seven years ago, I went to Philadelphia to do a, a class on presentation skills for Sunoco. And their headquarters is in Philadelphia. So I was staying at the beautiful Four Points Sheridan Hotel in Philadelphia, right at the airport. Now I'm a four to five mile a day runner, but when you stay at an airport hotel, there is no place for you to run. You can't run, I tried to run in the parking lot and that was dangerous. You can't go to the airport and run on the runway, even though they call it a runway, they don't like it when you do that. But I thought, well, would they have a gym in the hotel? I'm going to go down to the gym and I'm going to run on a treadmill, even though I had never run on a treadmill ever in my life. So I put on my clothes and I go down there and I got my iPhone and I got my earbuds. And as I walk into the, the little gym, there's another guy on another treadmill. And he's one of these, I mean, you know, 6'5", chiseled chin, just a great physique. His, his outfit actually matched. And he was running very confidently on that treadmill. He looked like he belonged on the cover of GQ magazine, okay? He was one of these guys. So I kind of nodded to him, and we do the guy thing when it's just two guys in the room, you kind of, eh, eh, eh. You, know, you, don't, you don't do a lot other than that, because you got to look like animals, you know? So I get on the treadmill, and I put my earbuds in, and I put my iPhone right there on the console of the treadmill, and I start to run. Hey, this is pretty easy. Speed it up just a little bit, run a little faster. And all of a sudden, my arm hits the cord connecting my earbuds to my iPhone. Hits it. My iPhone falls off the console, hits the deck of the treadmill, shoots off the back. I go down, and I'm right behind it. I stop. I pick up my iPhone. I look over at the guy, Mr. GQ, and he's got a little smirk going. I ignored it. Put my iPhone back on that console, put the earbuds back in my ear, start it back up again, I'm running. What I realized was the cord, as I'm running, the cord is going like this, okay? So it's going like this, my arms are going like this. Second time, my arm hits the cord, it hits the deck of the tre treadmill, shoots off the back, I'm right behind it again. I pick up my phone, I look over, and now the guy's chuckling a little bit. I grab my iPhone. This time I'm going to hold it in my hand. I take those earbuds and I jam them in my ear like I'm doing a cochlear implant. And I start running. Hey, I'm getting the hang of it. Speed it up a little bit. Just a little bit more. I'm moving pretty good and all of a sudden I do it again. I hit the cord. It flies out of my hand, out of the deck of the treadmill, fires off the back like a rocket. I go down to all fours and I am right behind it. I smash into the back wall. <laughs> now GQ is laughing at me. And I'm allowed to say, hey, this is hard. <laughs> but he wasn't having a problem with it. So I thought for a minute. And I, I kind of counted to 10. And I went, you know what? I don't think this is for me. And he said, I don't think so either. <laughs> That was the last time I ever ran on a treadmill. It's a true story. <laughs> I could have chosen to respond angrily to that guy because he was laughing at me. But I didn't want to, why ruin his day? So I thought, well, I'm going to handle it. I chose to respond 
in a humorous way. And we can all do that. Sometimes when you have a, a weird situation, the first, a lot of people's initial reaction is to get angry. Sometimes you just back off a little bit and figure out if there's a, a way that you can approach it in a friendlier way, maybe a humorous way. Change your brain. Change the way you think. Change the way you look at situations, opportunities. It's real easy to do. Look for humor every day at your job. If you do that, your job will get better. This is uh, Jerry, uh, the Jerry half of Ben and Jerry. This is Jerry Greenfield. And this is what he says about humor in the workplace. I agree with this 100%. That's why I've had such a crazy life. I've, I haven't worked a real job in 20 years. I try to find little jobs that I like to do, that are fun to do, because I don't want to spend my work life being miserable. I love this quote. So what did we learn today? We learned that I was a candy bar thief when I was a kid. I had a pink girl's bicycle. Look darn good in a mullet. We also learned that humor is good for relieving stress. But you have to practice it. It has benefits far beyond just feeling better. But really, what's so bad about just feeling better, right? Look for humor every day at work and in your home life. And I, I guarantee you, if you do this, your life will get better. And the best part about that is if we all did this, think how much different the world could be. If we all just backed off a little bit and tried to figure out how to find some place to laugh, some place to smile. I do this all the time when I'm running, and it, it, inwardly it makes me crazy. I'll run past someone, a couple people walking the dog at the park, and I'll smile and wave to them. And they look at me, they look away like they don't even have an interaction with me. It's the simplest thing just to kind of go, good morning. It makes my day when I do that. I'm telling you. We could change the world if we just started to use humor a little more often. Smile a little more often. So what I say is, take a shot. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. I had a great time speaking with you this morning.